Uh, people are back and uh, on board for our keynote. So here we go for our final session for the symposium. I am pleased to be able to introduce tonight's keynote speaker who will present Resistance and Resilience, Indigenous Philosophies of Collective Being as a Recipe to Living Well. Indigenous scholar Maria Elena Wambachano is an assistant professor in the Department of Civil Society and Community Studies at UW-Madison School of Human Ecology. Her research focuses on the intersections of food sovereignty, agrobiodiversity, sustainability, and climate justice. She's an active member of the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues and a lead author in the Global Report on the Values Assessment of Nature for the Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. Dr. Wamban Chano is a native of Peru and immigrated to Aotearoa, New Zealand when she was 19. She earned her doctoral degree from the University of Auckland in New Zealand. And Dr. Wambachano comes to us tonight from New Zealand, where she's working on her book titled Global, uh, Ingenu uh, Global Indigen Indigeneity, Food Sovereignty, and Well-Being. She also leads the international community-based project, Our Right to Food Sovereignty, with community partners in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Peru and in the United States. We'll first view a recording of the Maori elders welcoming ceremony for Dr. Wambachano before her talk at the urban Papa Tuanuku Maori. While her address is also pre-recorded to facilitate her, her participation from New Zealand, uh, Dr. Juan Bachano will be available for live Q&A afterwards. So please use the chat uh, to submit your questions. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Maria Elena Juan Bachano with her talk, Resistance and Resilience, Indigenous Philosophies of Collective Being as a Recipe to Living Well. Kia ki te anō ki tō te rangi, 
Thank you to my Maori Fano family for the beautiful property welcoming ceremony on the Papatanuku Marae. Amarae is a communal and sacred place. I feel humbled and honored for your hospitality and love. Kaho, poso, busho, kiora, and hello. Ayancho, Mantakani, Peru, Sutimi, Marilena. Greetings, everyone, from Aotearoa, New Zealand, and welcome. My name is Marilena Wambachano. I am an indigenous Quechua scholar of Peru, working at the University of Wisconsin-Madison in the School of Human Ecology. I'd like to acknowledge the land the University of Wisconsin-Madison occupies is the ancestral home of the Ho-Chunk Nation, who have called this land their job since time immemorial. I honor the history of resistance and resilience of the Ho-Chunk Nation the 11 First Nations residing in present-day Wisconsin boundaries. I wish for them and other indigenous nations around the world to remain vibrant and strong. I'd like to thank the hosts of this symposium, the Global Health Institute and the Native American Center for Health Professionals. It's been great two years planning this symposium, which involved many meetings. The collegiality and I can do attitude, as we say here in Atroa, have been incredible. Thank you very much to Dr. Jonathan Paz, Professor Laura de Bridge Brown, Valerie Peterson, Monette Hutchins, Daniel Yancey, and Gravel, and our IT guru, Amanda Kelly, for ensuring this conference runs smoothly. I joined the University of Wisconsin Madison in fall 2019 and I had the pleasure of meeting very inspirational and esteemed colleagues. One of them is Professor Laurie Pritch Brown, who is the director of the 4W Initiative on Women and Wellbeing and associate director of the Global Health Institute. I admire Professor Pritch Brown's leadership, vision, and kinship-centric approach. And moving forward, I will be an agenda in the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Thank you, Professor DePreet, for being an ally, friend, colleague, and mentor. Today, I'm very excited to deliver this keynote, which goes beyond a keynote speech for me. It is a celebration, 
an opportunity to recognize the cultural richness, traditions, and contributions of indigenous people's knowledge and regenerative food systems, and in doing so, save the environment and humankind. Well-being and traditional food systems are, are very fascinating subjects to study. In this keynote, I will focus on how Quechua and Maori peoples defined and enact well-being through the lens of food waste and their knowledge contribution in transforming food systems to be more sustainable and resilient. In this presentation, I want to share with you a bit more about my work exploring understandings of well-being within indigenous traditions. I do this through the value of food. I study the value of food to understand the importance of collective food relations, the importance of mapping out responsibilities, thinking about ethical principles that are required when you grow food, are required when you interact with one another, with another community. For example, the principle of consent, consent, getting consent from the from Pachamama, which means Mother Earth in Spanish, or a Papa Tunuko, Mother Earth in Maori, getting consent from Pachamama to grow food through a spiritual ritual, through a prayer. I just don't simply go and start growing food. I need to ask consent from the relatives residing on ancestral territories. All this leads and helps me to understand the important role of indigenous traditions, values, principles, and transforming food systems. Let me discuss about the value of food from an indigenous perspective. Food is more than something you just buy at the store. Food is sacred because, because it comes from our relatives. Food has a culture. What we eat has a history, and that history is not simply a history of food, but a history of culture, knowledge, and traditions. The value of food is often overlooked in approaches to tackle the food challenge. One of, one of those approaches is the current, the current industrial food production, which takes away the history, the cultures, that tie us to our, to our foods. Over the past five years, I had the pleasure to visit and collaborate with various indigenous societies, such as the Menominee people in the US, Gofan people living in the Amazonian region of Ecuador, and the Alicantai people living in San Pedro de Atacama, what is now Chile, and improving health and well-being. And all these cultural exchanges, the correlation between the value of food, food sovereignty, and well-being is prominent. You understand about the value of food when you interact with nature, when you grow your own food, adopting agroecological practices, traditional farming practices, sustainable practices, when you perform rituals and food ceremonies as a collective, revering the spirit of the ancestors, this human nature relationship that helps us to understand the value of food because once you actually engage in this process, then you feel that what you're eating is healthy. It's healthy because it's, it has been grown with love and care. And this is something that's missing from the current industrial food production. It takes away this human nature relationship. It takes away our control of growing our food, it takes away our control to decide how food is being produced, how accessible it is. It takes away a key principle or key understanding. If the land is healthy, the food is going to be healthy, and therefore people will be healthy. It's as simple as that, but it's something that is not it's not practice in real life, it's something that is missing from the current industrial food production. 
Appreciating about the value of food is important in understanding about the disruption of collected food relations. Since colonization of indigenous land started in the 16th century, indigenous peoples have experienced a disruption in the collective harmonious and spiritual relationship with nature. And that's because when the land has been, has been dispossessed, you no longer have the ability to interact with nature. You no longer have the ability to perform ritual ceremonies, engage in seasonal activities. As a result, indigenous land that once were green and vibrant, producing healthy and diverse food crops, are no longer healthy and diverse. From what we used to have on the right hand side, biodiversity is best developing capacity working with one another in the field growing food to process foods that disregards our history, our connection with the land, with one another, and more importantly, methods and approaches to preserve the health of the environment are disregarded in the current food system. As but our Tommy scholar, Carl White, points out, drivers of colonialism, such as industrial food production, continue to disrupt our collective food relations, which he describes as a collective self-determination of a group of people to decide how, when, by whom food is to be produced. It also includes cultural tradition, spiritual connections to food. Through collective food relations, Indigenous people derive self-worth, culture, and spiritual health. So if the land is taken away from them, if someone imposes a different diet to the ones that you are used to, that's an injustice. This injustice has been amplified in health issues. Quechua people suffer the worst rate of malnutrition. Maori people suffer the worst rates of diabetes and other metabolic disorders of any ethnic group in modern Aotearoa New Zealand. The same fate is experienced by other indigenous people living in settler -like colonial societies such as Native Americans. In the US, few cases of type 2 diabetes were recorded before 1940. Now it is the seventh leading cause of death for Native peoples. Despite these environmental and food injustices scenarios, indigenous peoples have demonstrated in this pandemic that their ways of knowing, being, and doing are very much relevant and vital to save the planet and humanity. One of the striking things I experienced during this pandemic was the sense of unity, of resistance, of resilience of indigenous peoples. I heard many times, no panic, we got knowledge and resources. It was fascinating and, and great to hear from my relatives in Peru when I called to check in on them, how are you, how are you doing? And they would ask me, how are you? You live in an urban area, how are you doing with your food? Are you coping? I heard that the supermarkets are full with people trying to, you know, uh, stock up with foods and the shelves are empty and I said yeah yes yeah, that's true and how are you oh we have our seed banks we have more varieties of seeds in the, from the last um, harvesting season we um, we have mechanisms and that's true they have mechanisms to cope with severe weather conditions with when it comes to drought they've been adopting these traditional ecological practices since time immemorial, so they are prepared. So in the same scenario happened here when I contacted um, Maori Fano family and asked, how are you doing? And different various Maori food gardens and communities came together and they were the ones feeding the urban areas and supporting one another. So you think about it, it is indigenous people's resistance to colonial oppression, in this case, industrial food production, resistance to patriarchy, resistance to the violation of nature's rights through an active engagement with the land, sea, forest, 
It is through the establishment of trusting kinship relationships that we foster intergenerational, cultural, and spiritual knowledge. If it were for this staunch resistance, we would not have healthy lands and healthy environments and therefore healthy food, especially to cope in this global, uh, global food crisis. Thanks to localized food systems, thanks to the many, many indigenous food gardens, both urban and rural, it's that we continue to grow, harvest, and continue engaging in seasonal activities. Otherwise, we will be left with this scenario during this pandemic. And I feel that this is what we need, a transformation of food systems based on traditional knowledge, understanding what a food system encompasses, encompasses a set of principles, values, responsibility. All these values, principles, and practices are embedded in deep philosophies of well-being, which are found in every single corner of the world, from the Pacific, Oceania, the Arctic, to the Amazon. Indigenous peoples are holders of traditional knowledge and practices for sustainable living, especially agrobiodiversity preservation for food security. You may have come across the concept of I in Summa Causa in South America, Ubuntu in Africa, Mino Bida Wisdom in Turtle Island, the United States. All these indigenous terms, sometimes translated as indigenous notions of living well, more broadly refers to a concept that summarizes indigenous worldviews or cosmovisions and how we ought to live well. Sometimes simply translated to living well in English, <clears throat> but it, it has a much deeper meaning. These philosophies hold, in this case, the philosophies I'm familiar with, Gage and Maori, these philosophies hold social, political, economic frameworks that govern the way diverse people within the nation relate to one another with members of other clans and indigenous nations and with the other non-human kings, the rivers, the mountains, with agency. As we continue to experience the negative impacts of climate change now the COVID-19 health crisis, we're experiencing more of an interest on alternative thinking of or frameworks of living well. And you hear more about economies of solidarity, economic of the growth, the circular economy emerging from Western thinkers. But how about understanding well-being for indigenous philosophies, for indigenous thinking? And why is it important for indigenous peoples to preserve the value of food to, to thrive as a collective? And this is something that I, that I'm very passionate about, about repositioning indigenous knowledge at the core of sustainable living. And as part of the transformation to food systems, to more resilient, reliable, and healthy ones. And this is what I did with my study of Quechua and Maori people. And I will share with you the findings, and I will provide you with a specific examples of how we enact a holistic collective approach to living well that will help to trans that's helping really transform the food systems. Working with Quechua Maori elders, community leaders, people involved in food production, involved in um, traditional knowledge, in the revival of traditional knowledge, in the revival of um, indigenous food ways as a way to improve health, the health of communities. The concept of hol holistic collective well-being came strongly. And to me, and this is the way how I came to describe it, to me, it is grounded in human beings' aspirations. For example, it is grounded in Ketchum Maori people's aspirations to live in harmony with nature and the spiritual world through ceremonies, um, through communicating with the plants, all the living beings, and respecting their agency, respecting biodiversity, and the nurturing, and nurturing the continuous rebirth 
of life cycles as a whole in its full richness and spiritual vitality. Underpinning the thinking is a spiral of fundamental ethics and values informing optimal human nature spiritual relationships for living well, continuously readjusting the balance between them. In this comparative study of Ketch and Murray, one of the main findings was that the concept of food sovereignty, specifically indigenous food sovereignty, is a driver of achieving holistic collective well-being. The concept of food sovereignty was coined in 1996 by La Via Campesina, an international organization and movement that gather indigenous farmers, peasant communities, people who heavily relied on the land, and people who were very concerned with how capitalism and neoliberalism were taking control of our food systems. Then the concept was redefined um, in Mali, culminating with the declaration of Nal Naline in 2007 to highlight the right of peoples to healthy and culturally appropriate food to highlight we just don't want food, processed food that give us enough calories to keep on working like a, like a robot because we have energy for a moment and then we need more of this food because they are ingrained with lots of sugar. No, we want healthy foods. It is our right to have healthy and culturally appropriate foods. While the concept of food sovereignty resonates with the aspirations of indigenous peoples, here I want to make the distinction that indigenous food sovereignty goes beyond the human rights-based approach embedded in the concept of food sovereignty. Indigenous food sovereignty emphasizes our collective and cultural responsibilities that we have with one another and our non-human non-human relatives. While the concept of food sovereignty resonates with the aspirations of indigenous peoples, here I want to highlight that indigenous food sovereignty goes beyond the human rights-based approach embedded in the food sovereignty concept. Indigenous food sovereignty emphasizes our collective and cultural responsibilities that we have with one another and with our non-human kin, the rivers, the mountains. They all have agency and they deserve respect as well. Indeed, we are now experiencing a revival of indigenous food sovereignty. We are experiencing an indigenous food sovereignty movement sweeping across North America, Oceania, Africa, and Latin America. We're seeing more of intertribal food summits like the ones organized by the United Nations, specifically um, Dan Cornelius has been part of this. Um, we're actually now being able to have more access to traditional foods. I have to say that the first time I tried Menominee Wild Rice was back in 2013 when I came to give a talk at Michigan State University and they provided me with this beautiful Menominee Wild Rice and I wondered why we don't have access to this beautiful and high nutritious um, indigenous foods. So we're seeing more and more communities um, taking a lead in reviving our cultural practices and taking control of their well-being and health by growing healthy food. And in the next slides, I'm gonna show you how both Ketch and Maori communities are enacting, defining their food systems. Ketch and Maori communities are enacting and defining their sustainable food systems by embracing key values and principles and understanding so how you live well as a community. One of them is kinship-centric approach. 
understanding that everything is interrelated, understanding that you need consent. You need consent to grow the land. You just don't go and exploit the land. And you need consent from community members as well. Respect, solidarity. All this mapping of relationships provide this interpersonal, intercultural, interpolitical relationships that are important when it comes to moment of crisis like the one we are experiencing. We have already a, a system, a kinship centric system that articulates a system of responsibilities, trust, consent, cooperation and hospitality between human and other non-human to build sustainable futures. Another value and, or a principle is collective self-governance, collective self-determination. And an example is the concept of self-governance translated in Quechua as IU. In the highlands of Peru, they think about working as a collective to ensure there is no wastage. So there is an IU leader and there are many communities. They come together, you could see in the picture, they come together to discuss how many families are going to be cultivating a specific crop. And they do this by being informed and guided of the seasons. They still follow, very much follow the Inca calendar, moon and solar calendar that provides them with a gui guidance of the kind of seasonal crops that they can grow. And they just, not all the families grow the same crops. They take turns to ensure there is no wastage and to ensure the, um, to ensure biodiversity continues to, uh, to prosper, to ensure that all communities will have access to food. Another value is self-determination autonomy. And the Maori concept of Tino Rangatira Tanga, literally translated to English as self-determination, encompasses that. And here I want to thank my dear Maori friend, Tina Nata of the tribe of Natipuro on the East Coast, for sending me these pictures. They speaks of Maori people's self-determination when it came to facing this pandemic. In March, when, they, uh, when the pandemic hit the country, they were, there was a main major lockdown. So city dwellers were asked to stay put, but they started leaving the cities and traveling up north to the east coast to rural areas, jeopardizing the well-being of vulnerable societies such as Maori. There are many Maori elders living up north and on the east coast. So what Maori communities did, they came together that was one of the main organizers of this um, coming together to block highways. And there was a way for them to protect themselves, but also the cultural component was very important. At the beginning of, you know, groups taking turns to ensure that people were no um, going up north in, in when, when they were coming from the city. I don't know if you can see there a picture of an elder conducting a karakia or a prayer. So those cultural elements are also embedded in when it comes to a certain self-determination, a certain your cultural identity. Holistic collective well-being entails having an understanding of ethics of care, ethical solidarity. And in this pandemic, we've experienced this main value shining through. We've had about communities rallying together and preparing caring packages. As I mentioned before, Many, many Maori in Quechua communities and in every part of the country were coming together to support one another, support communities. And that's about the act of caring, caring for one another, caring for the, not just individual caring, but it's about 
family and community caring. Ethics of cooperation is a vital value in achieving holistic collective well-being. And a key example is planting according to the seasons, planting according to indigenous agricultural calendars, the Maramataken Maori, the Inca calendar, the 30 moon calendars by the Nishinaabe in North America. All these enable us to learn together. It's all about collective learning. So you know what to grow in every specific month. You also know what sort of plants and what sort of fish, what sort of animals are gonna be part of these cycles of life. And also you are in tune with seasonal patterns. You are in tune, with, all your senses are in tune with what's happening with the brother, with the brother, um, relatives, human and non-humans that are working together. It's, a, it's part of the ecosystem. So if we think about ethics cooperation in that way, if we think about how growing food as a collective, being informed by seasonal patterns, of, by being informed of indigenous agricultural calendars, that definitely will help us to understand those seasonal patterns changes. We observe, we note, we take notes, we adapt, and we find solutions to it. As opposed to growing food in a very monocultural way that disregards the seasonal patterns, disregards all the ecosystems that are born and reborn in every single month, that is taken away. So if we start rethinking different ways through different ethical principles and values, then we start thinking more about how we can transform our food systems emerging from key values and principles embedded in indigenous knowledge. If, if we start thinking about shifting our paradigms shifting the ways, the ways in which how we relate to nature and reestablishing our intimate and respectful human nature relationship, we can definitely transform and empower communities to lead healthy lives. Moving forward, our well-being agenda and something that I'm very passionate about and it requires a paradigm shift. It requires continuing working together as a collective to revitalize food sovereignty, being able to have access to grow foods according to our cultural practices. Culture is an important element in achieving collective holistic well-being. And all this is part of, uh, I would say, a pathway to transform how we want to lead our lives, not just for the now, but for, for, the, for future generations. To transform the global agenda requires us to continue empowering local communities, working with them, working closely with them in the design of community engaged projects. And also it requires to amplify the voices in the knowledge contributions that they make to regenerative food systems. And this is why I'm part of a series of international reports because if people are making decisions about nature and they're making decisions about indigenous peoples, we need to be on the decision-making table. We need to be part of it, not just to express our concern, but to provide solutions, offer solutions, based on all this variety and many, many projects that focus on environmental restoration, food restoration, healthy food specifically. So all this work requires working at the local level to have an impact at the international level. The incredible work of indigenous communities, grassroots organizations, and indigenous scholars supporting in moving forward the revitalization of food systems needs to be recognized. The, our aspiration is to 
being able to have this pristine forest and polluted waters, green fields, being able to grow food, food that tell a story, foods with a story that tells where the food comes from, that tells a story about our identity, that tells a story about resilient communities. We need, we need to continue with this movement and growing our stories. And in my work, I argue and I continue working towards a paradigm shift away from industrial agriculture to place indigenous thinking, traditional agricultural knowledge and practices at the heart of food and nutrition security. As I mentioned earlier, this keynote speech is an opportunity to celebrate the incredible work of many indigenous communities, organizations, and indigenous scholars in moving forward to transformation of food systems. For example, in Aotearoa, New Zealand, the Papatonuku Urban Marae, Chira Park in Peru, the College of Anomaly in Wisconsin, to all of them and to the other organizations and communities, I say thank you. And the next video encompasses my vision for regenerative food systems and centering traditional knowledge at the core of food systems. And in 2014, we had Mari Elena join us uh, here at Papatuanuku Kōkiri Marae um, to help validate um, the mahi that we do here in growing pure kai, pure healthy kai. And so then in 2016, Mari Elena uh, joined us and she brought um, more international visitors here to Papatuanuku Marae. And this was her way of um, strengthening our relationship and working and engaging with Māori here in Aotearoa. And we, we've been so blessed to have her seven years on, and we are excited to be a part of not only her journey, but um, for her to be part of our journey, and she's also become part of our whānau. And so it's very important that when we share in um, healthy kai, um, healthy kōrero, uh, we just want to say that we've been really blessed to have Maria Lena here with us at Papatūnuku Kōkiri Marae in Aotearoa. It's been wonderful being part of this symposium. Thank you for listening. Sul Paiki, Kia ora, and thank you. Thank you, Maria Elena. This was an incredible, uh, insightful presentation, and I, I really look forward to uh, your new book, uh, Global uh, Indigeneity, Food Sovereignty and Well-Being. I can't wait to see it. Um, and so now we'll take questions. Thanks for uh, doing both the you know recording and being live. Uh, what what time is it where you are in, right now in New Zealand? Well, right now. Well, hello everyone. Thank you for tuning in. Um, it's quarter to one p.m. on uh, Thursday, the day after Wednesday. Okay. Good good afternoon. It's it's Wednesday night for us. So, so now we'll take questions. Um, so be sure to use the Zoom chat if you haven't already posted a question. I see uh, Laurie has posted a question. So, cause you're, I see you Laurie, why don't you go ahead and just verbally ask your question and then others go ahead and uh, raise your hand in the chat with through the reactions button on the right bottom or else, um, uh, or put it in the chat. Go ahead, Laurie. Thank you so much, Maria Elena, for a wonderful talk. Um, in some of your writings, you speak about rematriation as a practice um, for help us helping us to build a flourishing future. Can you say more about what rematriation is and why it's important? Yes, thank you for that question. Rematriation is a, is a concept that a dear native Native friend Robin White Mohawk, who is Mohawk, she started to rethink about ways to um, return seeds that 
were taken away from us, seats that we no longer have access to. So she decided to do that and to move away from the word repatriation that has a very colonial connotation. It was about more repatriation, bringing those beautiful seats back to us, bringing um, the seats, all those relatives back to Mother Earth, back to the relatives where we can still have this connection. So repatriation is about reconnecting again with our long lost relatives. And with that, continue revitalizing our culture and spiritual knowledge. Thank you. Maria, uh, Elena, I have a question for you. In your, in your work and as a uh, lead author on the Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, uh, looking at food systems around the world and, and the dominance of monocultures, um, how much progress is there around the world in, in um, not only food rights and sovereignty for indigenous people, but those healthy foods getting into the rest of the system and making our food systems more healthy and more sustainable? Are there some case studies of success stories? Because the US Farm Bill, I don't even want to talk about it, but um, are there some success stories there with with improving our, sustain, our sustainable food systems, both for food sovereignty, but also for um, better nutrition for the whole world? Well, well, thank you for your question. It's a great question because we often get confronted with the question, aren't you a romantic to think about indigenous food systems or a localized food systems can feed the world? But, well, the answer is yes. Indigenous people have been doing it since time immemorial. And that's the way how it continues to, to be. There are great examples. The only problem is that those examples are not amplified because of the dominant um, industrial food production. But the wonderful examples, the example of the Papatunu Komorai, revitalizing food system, culture in Auckland, which is a, the, one of the largest city in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And Wisconsin, we have the United Nations, we have Dan Cornelius doing exceptional work there, we have Robin White doing exceptional work on seed sovereignty and who is a Mohawk, there are the seed networks happening all around North America, the same in Latin America, we have international organizations, we have grassroots organizations such as Cheetah Park, um, we have the same in, in Ecuador, we always have this confrontation between you're not doing enough, but we are doing, and I feel that we are experiencing, and as I said before, an indigenous food sovereignty movement sweeping around the world. People are more aware of what they're eating. People are demanding more of traditional foods because there are definitely, um, there is this understanding that simple logic, if you, care for the land, the land will be healthy and therefore your food will be healthy. So there's this simple understanding that we need to keep pushing forward. And also we're demanding for that, we're demanding to be able to tell our own narratives. And that means being able to show this is our millennium food system. You know, we grow food following agroecological, adopting agroecological practices. It's a way of knowing and being, which is place space. Every single tribe, every single indigenous society will have their own traditions, values, and systems. And it's something that has continued to lead the way how we understand about well-being. And I strongly believe that it's, they should be at the heart of transforming food systems. Uh, understanding the value of food and understanding how we relate to one another, it's about collective well being, definitely will have an impact on amplifying the voices of indigenous peoples and localized communities who are heavily focused on preserving the health of the land and the environment. Um, as I said, there are many, many, and as I mentioned before, communities, organizations, um, 
not just in New Zealand, in Peru, in the whole of Latin America, Oceania, uh, moving forward our well-being agenda. And I hope, I hope that with this um, keynote, you know, we can actually be more aware of the incredible work that's been that's been done um, thus far. And as I said, this keynote was for me more about a celebration of the work that has been done. And thank you for being able to do that through this keynote. Great, thank you. We have a couple more questions in the chat. Uh, I can read them or uh, Elizabeth Larson, do you want to ask your question or do you want me to read it? I guess I'll read it, <laughs> okay? So Elizabeth uh, Larson asks, um, so she says she appreciates your view of well-being uh, as being collective, rooted in nature and not located only in the individual. Her question is, how might we understand and apply this to serve those in urban areas, especially in food deserts? That's a, that's a great question because food desert is a, is a, it still remains a challenge, a challenge that has been um, a challenge that indigenous communities and localized communities are working through together. Um, an example are the urban uh, food gardens, um, trying to teach the youth, trying to teach um, people very interested in growing their own foods. Because sometimes when you use definitely live in an urban area, you don't have access to, you know, be very active and have this human nature inter interaction. But just a simple act of actually coming together and listening and learning how you grow your food. And it only takes one person to start helping you to understand that when it comes to doing that within the food deserts um, it can be it can be tricky and challenging but there are great examples of food desert happening for example the navajo nation they're doing great work when it comes to food sovereignty and um, they're revitalizing the food systems uh, in arizona as well so we're seeing more of this um collective learning you know learning especially from the elders to the youth, not just relying from elder knowledge, but the elder discussing with the youth and working um, together as a collective. Also the revival of agricultural, indigenous agricultural um, calendars, um, which can be different when it comes to growing food in food deserts, um, but it's definitely a way to start thinking and rethinking how you can envision having access to healthy food and trying to break through this um, oppression because a food desert is an oppression. It's, an food in, it's a food injustice, how you have you come together to break that pattern. Great, thank you. We have uh, Mindy Yadev has her hand up. Mindy, you wanna unmute and ask your question? And, yeah, so hi. Uh, first, thank you for this keynote. This was really interesting. Um, you actually kind of just touched on this, but my question was like, so as like a college student, like what do you think is like the most effective way to like empower youth, like empowerment or engagement when considering like the connection between food with culture, which was I think something really important that you talked about. Thank you, Mindy, for that question. Definitely developing relationships. I think it's, it's important, especially for the students and in my work, how I approach that question, it's learning about research methods that are more in tune with the ways in which knowledge is acquired from an indigenous perspective or a localized perspective. It's just engaging youth to know and learn how you actually gain knowledge and that means building up relationships. For example, for me to be closely working with the Papatunu Kumarai on Rahi Marai and other uh, community food gardens, it took many, many years. And it was not just me showing up saying, I want to help you and I want to conduct eventually some work or some research with you, but it's more about being active. You know, a very, it's, Learning from an indigenous perspective, it's more about the doing, doing with your hands, 
working, being very cooperative with one another. So the first thing is go, they put me to work. They put me to work and through that working um, experience, I learned about the cultural protocols. I learned about the knowledge base, even sitting down and say, listen, just stay tuned and listen how we are turning, um, you know, from an, uh, the sunrise to the sunset. There is this pattern. Before the sunset used to be at 5.45 in the afternoon, now it's 6.30 and we're experiencing climate change. It's more about being in tune with um, the seasons, but that, re that requires having patience. It requires time, it requires responsibility with the communities. And it's something that youth um, should definitely be mindful of how they engage with those communities when it comes to learning new knowledge. Thank you. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, Maria Elena, we have another question in the chat uh, from Kristen Lettner. Um, what are some ways non-native people can support food sovereignty. What role do you see non-Indigenous people playing in this movement? There's a, there's, this is a great question, which actually it's kind of similar to the previous question. It's about how can you be part of this uh, change and transformation? Um, and the way how I address this is by asking, Definitely we welcome your help, but we, before you come into our spaces, this is my personal response. Think about your positionality. Think about your worldview. Think about your identity. And think about what is going to be your contribution within this food move, movement of food sovereignty movement. Think about what is it that you are bringing with you. And what is it that you think we can we can support you with? And I think it's understanding about your positionality, your identity, where you come from, and what you can bring that would help us to develop these um, reciprocal relationships, be on the same page. Um, I think we in here are gonna be probably very upfront with the answer. We don't want a white saver attitude anymore. We want to develop key partnerships really well par developed partnerships. And to do that, it requires reflection, inter-reflection. And we definitely welcome allies. So thank you for the question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and that question is sort of at the root of the theme of this entire symposium of, of really, um, you know, it's, 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 get, it's dealing with the, the bad practices of the past, colonialism, uh, race, uh, systematic racism, and our attitudes and the things we have to unlearn and, and appreciate. Um, we have a lot of learning to do and to have meaningful, respectful engagement that um, is sincere is part of uh, what we're trying to do at this annual symposium uh, because you know, when I, I had my own learning experience when I would talk about Aldo Leopold, who said, you know, look to the land because without healthy land and ecosystems, you can't have healthy animals or people. And then I realized he was late in the game when you really see what indigenous people have been doing for generations. Uh, it was an eye-opening experience for me. So um, we have one minute to go. Maria, Elena, do you have any last words of wisdom before I close the symposium? My only word of wisdom is that um, let's think about shifting our paradigms. Let's think about the opportunities that we could have um, to lead healthy lives if we just think and act and be more active in changing our current food system, which is killing us. And this pandemic has shown that. And I think we have the, we have the tools, we have knowledge and resources, we just need to be able to use them wisely. And to do that, 
we need more and more people. We need more, um, we have this small but growing body of indigenous scholarship, indigenous communities, organizations, we have more allies, we have more active participation, and we definitely need more of that. Um, so that would be definitely um, my main advice. We're in this together. I speak of uh, in the position of an indigenous scholar, but also of a concerned citizen. Um, I have a beautiful niece. I love my baby niece and I want my baby niece to you know, live in a very healthy environment uh, and lead decent futures and continue to prosper. And I think we ought, we ought to live well, all of us. And thanks so much for the opportunity um, to give this um, keynote speech. But as I said, more of, for me, it's more about celebrating and getting the traditional knowledge recognized as it deserves. Um, yeah, that's all I can say. And thank you so much for this space. Well, Maria, Elena, thank you so much uh, for your uh, valuable insights and, and sincere uh, words of wisdom. Uh, so I just want to thank you again and uh, for your work that shows us the critical needs to understand indigenous philosophies, how they can address monumental global concerns of today. Um, I'd like to once again thank all of our presenters uh, who have given us valuable insights into advancing health locally and globally for people, animals, and the planet. We will send links to today's recordings via email when they're available. Uh, thank all of you too for joining us today for our first major fully online Global Health Symposium. We sure have learned a lot and hope that you take home some new insights about challenges and innovative solutions um, for, for global health. So with that, um, I close the 2021 Global Health Institute Symposium. Thank you all for participating and have a good rest of the evening and rest of the week. Thank you.